from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. A medical breakthrough thanks to livestock, the latest on a man who received a kidney from a genetically modified pig. Problematically, as you know, there are serious gaps in current federal laws and reporting that expose our military and critical infrastructure to vulnerabilities and increasingly impact U.S. farmers, ranchers, and producers as they face challenges from state-driven Chinese actors. A warning about the growing threat from China when it comes to its influence in the U.S. Act. As farmers mull whether to plant more corn or soybeans this year, I don't think that you're going to pick up uh, or, or, you know, for instance, lose a lot of acres, for instance, in the I states. The latest estimates right now on Ag Day. Ag Day, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when blood, sweat, and tears meet rain, wind, and sun. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. We're continuing to follow a developing story. What's causing a mysterious illness in some dairy herd populations in the Southern Plains? Veterinarians are right now in the field trying to find out. As we first told you yesterday, dairies in the Texas Panhandle seem to be hit the hardest, but there are also cases reported in New Mexico and Kansas. On your screen are some of the common symptoms which can last up to 14 days. And while the illness is not reported to be deadly, it's cutting milk production by 10 to 20 percent. Now, as we said, the exact cause of that illness is not yet known, but the Texas Animal Health Commissioner says veterinarians are visiting dairy farms, monitoring and evaluating the cases in search for answers. We've uh, diagnostic labs have done uh, several tests and we have several uh, pending samples as well as incoming, sa incoming samples all the time. But right now the test results are what we call inconclusive, meaning although we've diagnosed some bacteria that's causing secondary pneumonia or maybe some viral pathogens that are uh, small positive, uh, right now, there's nothing conclusive as to an exact diagnosis for the, you know, if it is a pathogen, a bacteria, or a virus, we do not know what that is at this point in time. And now other state ag agencies are taking note of the illness and warning producers to make sure they're practicing good biosecurity in order to avoid possibly introducing the disease to their cattle. It's also worth noting there is no known risk to the public health and there are no restrictions on cattle from the affected states. Later next week, USDA will release its prospective plantings report and ahead of that, several ag brokerage firms are releasing their own predictions. Ag Day's Michelle Rook joins us and Michelle, which are they saying looks better money-wise this year, corn or soybeans? Well, Clint, when you look strictly at the corn soybean price ratio, soybeans do pencil out better. And that's why many private firms like agmarket.net and others are expecting more soybean acres this year at the expense of pretty much all other crops, but in particular corn. Interestingly enough, though, the degree of the shift varies within the industry and is less certain when I talk to farmers. Ag market is pegging corn acreage at 91.5 million acres down 3.1 million from last year with a 2.5 million acre increase in soybeans to 86.1 million. All wheat is down 3.4 million due to lower prices. Ag market partners believe the acreage gap will narrow between planted acres for corn and soybeans compared to 2023. So 11 million acres difference last year, you know, 94. Uh, and change down to 83 and change, uh, I've got to think, given the fact that corn, you know, just look at cash prices, for instance, that comes from the USDA down uh, almost a buck 80 year on year, uh, whereas soybeans is uh, about a buck 60. Uh, you know, relatively speaking, obviously soybean prices have performed better than corn. However, he thinks total U.S. acreage will also be down. I got to think you might uh, uncover uh, the fact that Maybe a few people aren't as excited about planting every single acre whenever you see, for instance, uh, some of these projections show uh, some red ink. And shifts between crops will come outside the major producing areas. Probably fringe acres, if I was guessing. Uh, I don't think that you're going to pick up uh, or, or, you know, for instance, lose a lot of acres, for instance, in the I states. However, he says it's tough to gauge. Now, farmers we talked to say many decisions were made last fall as cooperative weather allowed input application. And with a few exceptions, many are staying close to normal rotations. We're, we're usually half and half, half soybeans, half corn, and we'll, we'll remain the same. And 
I think most people in our area will probably probably do the same. Most of the guys I talk to are gonna gonna stay with their rotation to keep things so that you know so they're not off balance and in years to come. Uh, there, there might be some beans or corn that gets switched over to bean acres, but I don't think it's going to be a massive switch. It'll, I think it'll be minimal. However, farmers like Tom Higg of Minnesota say weather will play a role and could mean a few more acres of corn regardless of the price. If we have an earlier spring, farmers still like to plant corn. They like to get that crop in early. So it looks like Mother Nature will have the final say. I'm Michelle Rook reporting for Ag Day. Something that could prevent farmers from getting some field work done, a late season snowstorm pushing across the country. Meteorologist Martin Lowermore joins us with a closer look. Yeah, that's right, Clinton. The snow depth we're starting to see moving in across parts of the northern plains. This is fresh snows falling across the Dakotas into Minnesota and even parts of Iowa and Illinois as well. This is going to be coming down as we head into our tonight and into that overnight and even into the, this weekend as well. So let's take a look a little bit what we're going to be expecting as we head into our Friday morning. Again, seeing a lot of that snow fall across parts of the northern Great Lakes. This will continue its way across the northern Great Lakes, making its way into parts of New England as well. Also looking at a couple of these storms in the southern plains not going to be as severe as they were yesterday, but still could see some of them moving across. And as we head into our weekend, there's that second system moving its way across the northern plains. Again, these places didn't see much snow throughout the winter, and they're going to be starting to get pretty much more snow than they had all this winter already. Plenty of that moving across the northern plains and eventually making its way through that Monday as well as this next big system continues to move through, including a little more snow out toward the Great Lakes. Hey, two is better than one and over in Montana. Kim is celebrating the arrival of twins, twin calves. That is, she says they are with the mama cow resting up after a busy morning. And Kim, you're going to be seeing some snow pretty soon. I'll have more on that forecast coming up. The Biden administration has announced new automobile emission standards. The new rule applies to cars, SUVs, and most pickups for model years 2027 through 2032. And it could push U.S. automakers to manufacture more electric vehicles and hybrids in order to meet those targets. Now, right now, the average CO2 tailpipe release is about 240 grams per mile. Under this new rule, by 2032, that number would be just 82 grams per mile. But the auto industry could meet the limits if 56% of new vehicle sales are electric by the year 2032, along with plug-in hybrids or other partially electric cars or more efficient gasoline-powered cars. Now, now, the National Corn Growers Association coming out against this plan, saying it ignores the benefits of ethanol. Jeff Cooper, the CEO of the Renewable Fuels Association, expressing similar sentiment while speaking with Agritalk's Chip Flory. And that's what's so disingenuous about this yeah. regulation to begin with, is if you're only looking at the tailpipe, then yes, EVs are going to get a zero. They don't even have a tailpipe, right? But that yeah. says nothing about all of the upstream emissions associated with burning coal to make electricity, burning natural gas to make electricity, mining minerals out of the ground to make these batteries, mining the metals out of the ground to build these vehicles, and, and then disposing of the batteries. None of that is included in this in this thing. Cooper adding ethanol and other biofuels should also be declared carbon neutral or zero emissions as well because it's the same amount of CO2 that is going to be absorbed by the atmosphere by the next crop of corn. Another hot topic on Capitol Hill this week, foreign land ownership. The House Ag Committee holding a hearing to specifically address concerns about China's possible buys of U.S. farmland. Leaders on both sides of the aisle expressing concern about the potential threats to national security, including the risks posed by such purchases by China near military installations. Now, a former Treasury Department official under President George W. Bush sounding a warning to lawmakers. Thwarted and planned Chinese investments like the Fufang wet corn mill plant in North Dakota and land and farm acquisitions in Oregon, Texas, Nevada, in close proximity to point of the spear U.S. military bases and nuclear facilities is not coincidental. Given China's regional and global military intents, vectors that provide intelligence are constantly being sought, whether they provide locations for cranes, silos, windmills, or farms above or adjacent to military or sensitive facilities or telecommunication towers or underground cables. 
Also an issue, what former U.S. ambassador to the U.N. agencies for food and agriculture, Kip Tom, said has been a gradual offshoring of key ag tools. That includes pesticides and crop nutrients. Nearly 40 percent of the world's phosphate and 28 percent of global nitrogen is now produced in China. As we wrap up another week of trade, what have commodity analysts learned? Well, we ask that question coming up next. And later, we've heard about efforts to use genetically modified pigs to save people waiting for an organ transplant. Doctors just trying to begin. Details after weather. Ag Day is brought to you by Germinator Closing Wheels. Germinator Steel Closing Wheels provides a 13 bushel advantage per acre in no-till and a 7 bushel advantage per acre in conventional. Do you have enough room in your bin to switch to the Germinator? Main Street Index is now at its weakest level since June 2020. The survey of rural bankers from Creighton University now sitting at 38 points. That's the seventh straight months of it sitting below a growth neutral of 50. That's down more than eight points from just last month. Ernie Goss, the leader of the survey, says higher interest rates, weaker commodity prices, and higher grain storage costs push the reading lower. The Dow continues to rally, trading above 40,000 on Thursday, but commodities we're less than stellar. Michelle Rook has more in Markets Now. Thursday's market closes mostly higher in the grains and last check futures mostly lower. Brad Coima with Coima Coima Barlick is back with us. Brad, let's start off in the grains, a little higher closes, new highs for the move in soybeans. How much of this has just been fun short covering? I mean, we're into month, end of quarter going into the big USD room. Well, I think that's certainly a big part of it, uh, Michelle, to say that there's radically different fundamentals here uh, this time of year. Uh, is a stretch. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, you know posturing ahead of the of the grain report is 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 part of it, but I, some of it is is technical related. You know, you and I have talked about this. You know, can we get back above twelve dollars? And, and we finally did. And so you had some follow through buying. I would think from some of the fund community here, uh, and even the corn's got just a hair better story in my opinion with uh, the ethanol grind picking up and basis levels at least in my neck of the woods starting to tighten up. So modest rally. Uh, it's the time of year where you should expect it though uh, between now and May one. <clears throat> The seasonals would suggest that there's a better chance of higher than lower. So I don't think it's going to run away, Michelle, but at least a little bit of encouragement. So what about the cattle market? Higher cash trade on Thursday, but yet the market went the opposite direction. This is the third reversal. What's going on? I learned how to trade futures. What I, the way I was taught is you sold weakness and you bought strength. If you're trading that way, you're having a very difficult time. Uh, this is the third time in two weeks where we've made new highs for the move on great news. Cash was really good today, as high as 193 in the north, okay, two, three higher, 188 in the south, two higher. And then we make new highs and then we fail and, and then we reversal down again. You know, the there's an old saying, you know, the market makes a high the day the news is the best. Okay, I get that, but uh, this seems to be odd activity. I, I, you know, it's this time of year where seasonally you, 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 you think you look for a top. Yet the cash news is so good. It's very confusing. But the deferreds, I think, are also worried about that cattle and feed report. The fire in Kansas did not have much damage. So that wasn't much of a market factor, you think? I think a reefer started on fire, maybe caught with, uh, to another trailer or two, but was contained to outside. There was some smoke that made it into the building. Uh, so they had to do a little bit of maybe a, a clearing out some of the meat in the cooler there. Uh, but no, not not the Holcomb fire of 2019, thank goodness. Thanks so much, Brad Coima with Coima Coima Barlick. We'll have more Ag Day coming up. Hey there, before we get into that wintry stuff, we're going to talk about a couple of the storms that could be on the stronger side in the southern plains. This is going to be just south of Dallas and just north of San Antonio. You'll be seeing some of these snow, uh, not the snowfall, but the severe storms trying to run through. You could be seeing the, of course, damaging winds, the large hail, and maybe the possibility of a brief spin up or two in some of these. But luckily, just going to be some scattered severe storms across central and eastern Texas. Then moving into your Saturday, luckily, that threat should be gone. Now, snow going to be continuing across parts of the Great Lakes. This will continue in 
into our Friday and even into our Saturday, continuing its way into New England, where there could be getting a decent amount of snow. But if you're looking over toward the Pacific Northwest and just north of the Rockies, another system making its way. It's going to bring in more snow to places that have already seen that snowfall in the northern plains. Your Dakota is going to be looking out toward Minnesota as well. A lot of these places will start seeing that snowfall coming in yet again. So this takes into account your precipitation, both snow and rain. So we're seeing a good amount of that rainfall making its way across parts of the Sierra Nevadas and a little bit of that higher elevations in towards the Rockies, seeing more of that uh, snowfall continuing. Of course, more down here. A lot of that rain is going to be making its way across the eastern seaboard. You can see with the jet stream where these showers and storms are going to be coming from. You can see this low pressure system making its way across. There's that low course moving its way into the Great Plains or Great uh, Northern Great Plains into your Great Lakes. That will cause things to be a little bit on the wetter side in terms of that snowfall. And there's that second system as we head into our Sunday and Monday on your jet stream, watching this drag all the way across the entirety of the northern US. More of that snow going to be coming in as you head later on into that next work week. Things will definitely be pretty snowy across the Dakotas and into Minneapolis. Manette and Missouri is a cloudy day, high around 66, low just near freezing. Chester, South Carolina, rainy day, temperatures in the 50s. Finally, Abilene, Texas, partly cloudy, high comfortably 74. Innovation in crop genetics tops our smart farming focus today. USDA just approving six new biotech traits for plants. Now, here's a look at the list. The Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service announcing the approvals. They include Yield 10 Bioscience with two camelinas modified for improved seed oil quality. Bayer Crop Science receives approval of canola modified for herbicide resistance. New seed also with canola and a brown mustard that's modified for improved product quality and herbicide resistance. Yelly Advisors has a new soybean modified for what it's calling altered product quality. Michigan State University with a potato modified for fungal resistance to potato late blight. And the University of Wisconsin has a hemp modified for reduced levels of THC and CBD. That's now approved by APHIS. A story we've been following, doctors using organs from genetically modified pigs for humans. Well, on Thursday, a Boston hospital announced doctors transplanted a kidney from a pig into 62-year-old Rick Slayman of Massachusetts. He's been battling in-stage kidney disease. It was the first time a pig-to-human kidney transplant has ever been done. The pig kidney was genetically edited to make it compatible with people if this transplant takes, doctors say it could open the door for thousands of patients with kidney failure currently waiting on a transplant. Right now, about 17 people die each day waiting on an organ. As we've been reporting in recent years, there have been two pig heart transplants. However, both men died within months. We often report about the damage and destruction of wildfires, but they can also be incredibly useful for land management when used carefully. We'll take a look at some examples in Louisiana next. Fire plays an important ecological role in managing forest land, but conducting the prescribed burn in a responsible manner involves making a plan. As LSU Ag Center reporter Craig Gotro shows us, a group of industry professionals and private landowners participated in a burn certification course to learn how to safely execute a burn. Pine forest and the animals that live there can benefit from prescribed burns. These control fires remove fuel from the forest floor and allow sunlight in to stimulate growth. But a good prescribed burn requires careful planning and monitoring weather conditions. Anybody can burn. I mean, it's, it's legal, but there's a certain way to do it right, and there's a certain way to do it wrong, and we're trying to do help with the, the right part. The burn certification course was taught at the Louisiana Ecological Forestry Center. The center has a conservation mission focusing on the longleaf pine ecosystem in which fire plays an important role. We get to teach a little more about wildlife habitat enhancement, we get to teach about proper and, and very safe prescribed burning, and uh, that also allows us to create a safe scenario for ourselves, our infrastructure, and our neighbors. Last year, Louisiana had one of its worst wildfire seasons ever. A focal point in the class was to teach the fundamentals that go into a well-managed prescribed burn so that it doesn't get out of control. 
fire has some inherent risks that you know we try to mitigate as much as we can but we do all that paperwork and kind of cover all of our, our bases where we have the least possibility of that happening. The center is an ideal place to conduct a course and McKay has seen the benefits fire has brought to the longleaf pines on the property. So it's a great tree of choice. We get to grow that timber product, which is a, a fabulous timber product. And we can also do things with the land that create a more wildlife friendly scenario. Prescribed burns are performed on approximately 1,000 to 1,500 acres a year at the center. With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Gautreaux reporting. All right, thanks Craig, and that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.